Louise Bedford here, your host of the Talking Trading Podcast. This is how traders excel. Now, I knew I had a problem this morning when I woke up and I actually looked for the two times speed on my meditation app. Now, there's a problem with that. <laughs> Goodness me, sometimes we can feel so rushed. We don't know where to begin and we don't know how to speed up through our day. One of the things that I bet you as a trader you've been doing today is to try and work out how to fit more things into your life. Now, I have invited Jackson Milan onto the show to help us not only run our trading business more effectively, but also so that we can actually see where the money is and he can help us through some of our wealth mindset blocks. Now, Jackson is the absolute master of profit and wealth. He's helped his clients build over $2 billion in combined wealth, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Aureus Financial. That is a fantastic setup that you've got here, Jackson. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've got some more nice things to say about you, but what have I left out? Uh, my absolute pleasure, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation. Uh, I, uh, I'm also the owner of an animal sanctuary called Aureus Acres. We've rescued and rehomed over 100 animals, and uh, we love, live up in far north Queensland on a 70-acre property. Uh, we, uh, we, we live the dream. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm an all-round good bloke and nice guy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, in line with that, the thing that I really liked is when I said, have you got something to provide for my talking trading listeners? And you immediately said, yes, I'm just going to have a look at that. It's wealth healthcheck.com.au and there are a whole heap of bonuses and resources that you've loaded up especially for my people so that site again is wealthhealthcheck.com.au so look Jackson there are so many places that I want to start here we've got quite a few mutual friends. One of them is Michael Yardney, who is in the property game. I want to talk about your thoughts about building success, because really in terms of the avenues that we have available to us, we have things like business, we have the stock market, and we have property. And most people combine those aspects. You help people in all areas. What role does mindset play in achievement? It's a huge role. I think it's the single most important role. And I think what this really starts with, Louise, is that most people mistake the those things which are vehicles for the destination. They get all consumed by creating wealth through whatever one of those, those means that they choose or potentially all of them. But they lose sight of the destination of what is really important. What does financial freedom mean to them? And more importantly, why is it of significance? And the issue that we run when it comes to mindset is that particularly in this day and age, because we're constantly bombarded with the societal pressures of what financial freedom is supposed to mean, that we sometimes inherit other people's dreams and goals and we assume that they are our own. And it makes it far more difficult for us to create financial freedom when we are not intrinsically motivated by the outcomes that we're pursuing. So I think first and foremost, everyone needs to master the art of conquering their money mindset and running their own race to financial freedom and defining what that financial freedom really means to them. And once you conquer that, the pathway to get there becomes a whole lot easier. And uh, I've been able to help thousands of clients do that uh, and run their own race and escape the matrix as a result of just solving for that particular problem. Oh, there's so much in what you've just said. I want to tie back to the idea that your ladder has to be leaning up against the right wall. There's an aspect called the sunk cost fallacy, and it's when you've put your heart and soul into an area, it hasn't quite worked out the way that you wanted, but you just stay in it for the next 40 years because that's what you trained to do. What are your thoughts when people are facing something that they've worked hard for in the past, but they're having trouble seeing that that is the thing that's going to bring them joy in the future. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I see this a lot. And I'm very fortunate that I've never found myself having to encounter that situation for myself. I've always been somebody who was willing to back myself wholly. And if I wasn't on the right path, I was always able to be honest with myself that I'd maybe walked that wrong path and I've got to a position that I wasn't happy with. And I was happy to walk a couple of steps backwards in order to, to course correct and get back on track. But unfortunately for many people, they become a prisoner to the pressures of their life. I think it was famously said by Joe Rogan that the killer, the killer of dreams is the burden of responsibility. And I think this is very, very important in this day and age. 
we see these people get kind of caught in these golden handcuffs. They create these careers. They go in and pursue money um, because they've got this big mortgage and families to educate and feed and, and entertain. And then they get to a point whereby they go, wow, this isn't really what I thought my life was going to be, but I've come too far and there's far too much risk to go backwards. So I think it's really important that we need to firstly acknowledge, one, what is the reality of my current situation? And if I was at the end of my life and this was my final day, would I hold a regrets continuing to stay on this path? And two, what is the beckoning road, the road that is calling me that in, in my heart of hearts and the depths of my soul uh, will fulfill me and allow me to pursue my fullest potential? And I think it's having this kind of conversation, which can seem a little bit woo-woo, particularly when we're talking about wealth that's very much kind of ones and zeros and very logical, that we must blend this idea of, of mindset and maximizing human potential with understanding the economics of making the most of your financial position in order to create a life of abundance. And I think it's those two things together that allow us to create true financial freedom. I think what you're talking about as well is the importance of staying inspired so that we have the energy to continue. Energy is so fickle, isn't it? We can have it stripped away within the blink of an eye. And if we continue to work in that field where we're not getting that energy back, that spells burnout. What are some of the other challenges that you see your business people? Because you're mainly dealing with business people, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the other challenges they face in their journey towards creating success and wealth? Yeah, it's interesting. The other part here, right, that we're in this day and age where it has never been easier to make money. Like, let's go back 100 years. The idea that you were going to be able to kind of start a business, like the barrier to entry of starting a business was tremendous. There was no internet. There was no none of this kind of instantaneous or asynchronous communication that we've got. We've got Slack and Teams and all of these things. Um, we can work from, for, live the laptop lifestyle on, on a beach in Bali. But the, the, the bar has never been lowered to make money. But that also perpetuates the lack of patience that people have around real wealth creation. Real wealth creation whether it be through business, of building a business that has real intrinsic value that can be sold for a profit, uh, that can be put under management to allow you to derive leveraged income, building a sizable property portfolio and being able to, to have passive income there, building a substantial share portfolio that's able to allow you to derive benefit. It takes time. And the vast majority of people try and get rich quick and, and they often overexert themselves for a period of time where they get to that burnout and they haven't set themselves up in a strategy to basically play the infinite game of to play a game that they can do for the rest of their life. Like, here's the thing, Louise, many of my clients come to me because they want to retire. Okay. They go, I want to build a business and I want to create enough passive income where I never have to work again. And they go, okay, cool. That's great. Well, let's talk about that. Let's fast forward. When do you want that? Okay. Five years time. Beautiful. So let's say you've sold your business. You've got all this money in the bank that's invested. It requires really little time for you to manage. What then? Oh, well, I'll travel. Okay. And once you've ticked all those things off the list, what then? Ah, uh, uh, maybe charity. Okay. And what then? I don't know. Maybe go back to work. Exactly. Right. So the most people want to retire because they acknowledge that the current workload that they have is unsustainable. And either they've worked themselves to burn out or physically have got to a point where they can't work anymore. Instead, my philosophy, and now once I educate my clients, the vast majority of them shift to, is that I want to build enough economic independence where I have the ability to choose what I do with my time, but I will work in the things that fill me with joy and that, that fuel my passions and that essentially is not really work. Like I will never retire. I will work for the rest of my life. And I'm fortunate enough that at 34, I already have financial freedom and I don't have to work anymore if I don't want to, but I couldn't imagine a day that I don't work because I love doing this. And isn't that what most people want? And when we really unpack that, that's the crux of it. How do you create a sustainable journey to that economic independence and then be able to work because you're passionate and you enjoy it, as opposed to having to work to put food on the table and feeling hamstrung by your situation? I want to get back to that countdown to retirement, that really interests me because a lot of our traders are in that countdown process. What are some of the things that our traders should consider in relation to giving up their full-time role? And it could be at the age of 34 and becoming a full-time trader. 
Yes. So in my latest book, my fourth best-selling book called Seven Figure Profits, I, I created this framework that's basically called the Financial Independence Matrix. And look, a general rule of thumb that all of us need to work towards in order to define the financial vehicle required for us to be financially free is a commonly used rule called the Rule of 25. So in a nutshell, if you're able to create 25 times the cost of your lifestyle in investment assets, then you should be able to be financially free pretty much in perpetuity, right? You should be able to fund that lifestyle without any, any concern. So the aim of the game is, well, what is the pathway that you're going to take to 25 times your financial independence? And is that employment? Well, how far is that going to get you? Is it starting a business? Okay, well, then you're probably going to have a bit of a J curve for a period of time, and then you're going to build up that business. Is it launching something like this trading system where you've got supplemental income allowing you to make kind of a smoother transition so that trading income hopefully overtakes your corporate income and or potentially you do both, and then you've got dual incomes, which allows you to get to that 25 times faster. I think the most important thing is understanding, well, what's that pathway to get to 25 times? How many years have you got? And then assuming that you're at that point where you have the freedom to choose to do what, you're t with, what you want with your time, how are you going to choose to invest that time? Because one of the challenges that I've seen from a lot of my clients, and I can count on one hand the number of my clients who have actually fully, completely retired, never to work again, the vast majority of them were the busiest people that I knew that they filled their life with hobbies and interests and, and charity and giving back and doing all of these things. Um, like even my parents, my parents are, are now in their 70s and they're the busiest people I know. And without that, people diminish the quality of their life very, very quickly. And there's statistics that have shown that the vast majority of them live shorter than those, so that those who basically have purpose and fulfillment in their life. So I think that's the probably biggest consideration. Assuming that you've spent an entire life trying to create that economic independence, what is it for? What's going to light you up and fill you with significance and purpose and give you a reason to keep living? And without that reason, the fire gets extinguished very, very quickly. Mm, I'm loving that. Is there a risk that people may feel that they have to achieve this particular utopian level and then they can be happy? I remember mm. when I had my first baby, within just a few weeks, people were saying, so when are you going to have another baby? And I'm like, you are kidding me. Come on. So <laughs> I think we have to be careful of that arrival fallacy too, thinking that yes. once we hit this point, everything else will be fantastic. I'd love your, your opinion on that. It's really interesting. I saw a post actually by Ray Dalio recently where he created this, this graphic that showed all of the primary milestones that happen from birth to death. And they do happen typically in a sequence for the vast majority of people. But I've always been a big believer, once again, challenge the status quo and ask myself, are these the things that I really want? Um, and is it the destination or the milestone that's going to fill me with the, the, the fulfillment and the, 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 the feeling of success and achievement? Or is it actually enjoying the journey to getting there that is the, the most fulfilling part? And funnily enough, my first book is called Enjoy the Journey for that very reason. I think the path to creating financial freedom and achieving these milestones is the most fulfilling part. It's about... In investing that bandwidth, investing the blood, sweat and tears, learning the skills, putting them to work, navigating the challenges, doing all of these things, it's all part of it. Um, and it's just ensuring that we're pursuing the, the right things for the right reasons. And I think you're right. Like most people think, okay, I'm going to get to a point where I achieve this particular goal and I'm going to kind of pull the foot off the accelerator. Most of us who are, ambition are all, ambitious are always going to ask what is next. And there's a famous quote in Stoicism that, that I really love that says, every man in this world should understand the difference between enough and extra. We should know how much is enough and we should have the position to choose to pursue extra for fun. And I think this is the art of life, uh, the art of growing as a human being. I'm a big believer that as a human being, we are like a tree. We're either growing and thriving and rotting and dying. So the idea that we're always going to chase that next thing, as long as we're doing it for the right reasons and, and we understand the trade-off associated with that decision that we make, then by all means, let's keep chasing it and keep pursuing that, that next milestone. 
Mm. Yeah, I like that thought that we are always in the hunt, that there is always a part of us that can be fulfilled that isn't quite fulfilled yet. I was with one of my members of my mentor program. He was 98 and I was with him holding his hand two days before he died. And I said to him, Ted, what is it that you haven't achieved yet? And he told me a list of things that he hasn't hasn't done and that he wants to do. And it was so exhilarating to know because we both knew he was dying. We both knew this was the end of the rope for him. And he gave me life advice in that final time. So I think there is a lot to be said for keeping that bountiful attitude and making sure we've got things that we are progressing towards. A lot of the people who are traders are professionals and they are in their own business and they do sometimes fall under the guise of, I've been great in this one area of my life, so of course trading will be a breeze. Now, I would love your idea on how to prepare yourself for a new arena. That, yes. I think, is something that a lot of people struggle with, that transition. It is really a tough transition. And look, to be fair, I've struggled with it the two. I think all of us do. We have this confirmation bias uh, just because one thing is true uh, and we have mastered one particular area that we think we can have the Midas touch and go and take that elsewhere. And I think it's important to understand the contributing factors to success. And what this comes down to, and I, I implement this in my own business and we teach our clients this principle, it's about being able to objectively assess yourself and others by four things. First thing is about being able to assess your confidence. And if we've got success in one realm and uh, then and we've got proven results that validate that, I think that's the hardest part initially, right, of being able to back yourself. I've been able to achieve this. I've created this. Look at me. I'm great. And um, it's good to be confident. So you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. Next thing you need to assess yourself is on capability. Do I have the skills, the experience, the track record in this specific realm that set me up for success? Now, sure, there's transferable skills. They're soft skills. But really, like if I've, I say, for example, I've had a professional services business, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be a great trader from the get-go, right? I'm, I'm starting back at, at kindergarten. So capability is the next part. The next thing is commitment. How committed am I to succeeding in this particular area? And I must have some level of investment. I need to have a purpose. I need to have a why. And we can solve confidence. We can even solve capability. But if you are not committed, there is very little that you will achieve in this world without commitment and because you're not going to be prepared to do what it takes. You may say you will, but you'll often procrastinate. And the last one is courage. Are you courageous to push on, to take a risk, to, to put, get skin in the game, to prove that you're prepared to do more than others? Because my philosophy in the world, I believe in the capitalist system and I believe that we are remunerated commensurate to the value that we create in society, but you must be prepared to do more than the average if you want to be rewarded more than the average. And that takes courage. So assess yourself, confidence, capability, uh, commitment and courage, and I think that will give you a pretty objective measure of have you got what it takes to, to succeed in this new realm. Oh, my gosh, that is such gold. I love that. I love that, the four Cs. A lot of people, though, myself included, I really struggled with the confidence aspect until I could actually prove it to myself that I could make money out of the markets, I just found I didn't feel that that was within my scope. Mm. What advice would you have for people trying to, I guess, be objective about their confidence level? Because you don't want to be overconfident because that correlates with poor trading behaviour as yes. well. So you do want that objectivity. But a lot of people struggle with that confidence. And I'd love to hear how you feel people can develop that. Yeah, I think this is where you, our philosophies align. And I'm a big believer in planning. You need to be able to create the plan. You need to be able to work the plan. And the idea of creating that plan really comes down to a couple of things. Firstly, you need to be able to clearly ascertain where you are right now. What's your current position? And be able to reflect on what got you to where you are. And um, Because reflection, if we reflect, we're able to understand, well, what were the contributing factors that got me to where I am, good, bad, and indifferent, right? Then we need to be able to define where are we trying to go. Okay, so I want to be able to build a million-dollar share portfolio. And 
That's my goal. I want to be really specific. We use the SMART goal system. We want to get really specific around what we're trying to achieve. We want to be able to measure it. We want to make sure it's attainable. It's realistic and it's time bound. So, okay, I want to build a million dollar portfolio in five years. Okay. And then we reverse engineer that because it's far easier for us to reverse engineer the destination to where we are than it is to just trying to kind of plan ourselves and extrapolate it out into the future because we could end up anywhere, right? And what that then allows us to do is to create something that's quantifiable that we can start tracking against. And confidence should come from your ability to iterate in pursuit of achieving and exceeding that plan. So one of my most powerful tools that, I, that I've, I've implemented is called the reflection loop. And I spend a lot of time reflecting. And the fundamentals of a, re of a reflection loop is having a perspective of what is going to happen, of what, what do you perceive? So the million dollars in five years. Then we want to look at the reality. And we want to see how closely these two circles overlap. And then we want to be able to objectively and, and ruthlessly assess why aren't they perfectly overlapped? What were my contributing factors to that overlap? And what are the external factors that influenced that overlap? And then constantly iterate and improve. And that, once again, it just it removes all of the ambiguity associated with should you be confident or should you not? And... That's been my approach to now creating an eight-figure business. Mm, I love how you're providing structure around such quite an intangible thing. It's it's very good because then you can tick things off a list. You know, though, some of my traders, it's almost like they're struggling against some sort of unseen force, like they're capping their own potential. It could be their boss's words, often it's their spouse's words, or maybe even a parent's words that seems to be, I don't know, holding them in place that they can't get beyond. When business owners come to you with that situation, what do you say to them? I'm a big believer in mindset and inner game. And I believe that words mean nothing really in isolation. How you choose to interpret them is entirely up to you. Um, and I think for a lot of people, if somebody has said something that is holding you back, that becomes this invisible anchor that holds you in a particular position, that, that you feel that you're unworthy or that you do not deserve a particular outcome or you aren't smart enough or successful enough or ambitious enough or whatever the, 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 the framework may be that's holding you back, that it is only holding you back because somewhere deep in your subconscious that there is an element of truth that you choose to believe. And typically speaking, most of it is to do with some sort of version of ourself as a child who has encountered some sort of situation that we have found that to be true, that in our five-year-old minds that we've taken a piece of that, that we've interpreted that we aren't worthy and that we don't deserve this level of outcome. So until we resolve that trauma, until we're able to move beyond that, then we're never going to let go of that anchor because we're, it's, it's that superficial thing has dropped down into something that's really significant. So this is not necessarily my area of expertise, but I've done a lot of deep work in this space. You need a mindset coach. You need somebody who understands uh, neuro-linguistic programming and understands how to play that inner game, to go back to that five-year-old version of yourself and to resolve those unresolved traumas. And I can speak from firsthand experience that when you resolve those things, it becomes like rocket fuel that will propel you to new heights that you never thought possible. And this is the biggest factor, right? The quality of our experiences and the outcomes that we achieve are based on the quality of our mindset and the quality of our ideas, the quality of our actions, and the quality of our ability to reflect objectively and harshly on our results and be able to, to iterate and improve. And if you're not focusing on elevating all of those things, then you are never going to elevate the quality of your results. It's no accident people become a success. There's no doubt there are definite footprints that show they're going in the right direction. Tell me about some of your clients. Give me a success story. Yes. So most of our clients are multi-six-figure and seven-figure business owners. We primarily work with service businesses and all of those service businesses come to us because they know how to make money, but they don't know how to keep it. So we had a client that we've been working with for the last couple of years who run a fantastic trade business and he'd been running for about 20 years. He'd been able to create a multi-seven-figure business. And 
for over that time, he'd been able to be really successful. His, his competition came and went, and he was always the best in his market, and things were looking pretty good. He'd been able to take money out of the business, build wealth, buy his home, do all of the nice things, but something changed. And all of a sudden, his business turned into a cash eating monster, where basically he had his first year in 20 years where he had close to a $100,000 loss in his business. When you think like you got a multi-seven-figure business um, that had been doing well for so long to lose, it's so defeating. Because he was doing the right things and like he, he thought he was doing the right things. He was doing all of the work and he was, he was trying to kind of burn the candle at both ends to turn the needle, but it just wasn't seen to be happening. So what we did is a few things. The first thing we did is we reviewed his old financial operating system. And one of the biggest challenges we see, particularly in seven-figure businesses, is the phenomena of cash flow creep. That as the business grows... We often see that their gross their gross profit or their cost of sales will also grow and their operating expenses will also grow, which basically over time erodes their profit. So they've got a bigger business, but in many cases, they're making less money. Second thing is this lack of transparency. And um, most business owners focus on that top line revenue. Okay, I've just got to get more leads. I've got to get more clients. I've got to get more top line revenue and everything else will work itself out. And the third part is collecting the cash. Just because your profit and loss says that you've made a profit, there are so many business owners that go to their accountant at the end of the financial year and they say, hey, you've made a great profit. And they go, well, where the bloody hell is all of this money? And it's because they don't understand their cash conversion cycle of how does money transfer through their profit and loss onto their balance sheet and into their bank account. So with this particular client, we did a few things. We implemented a financial performance dashboard and we educated him around all of his numbers. It's probably no dissimilar to the work that you do with, you, with your trading clients of helping them understand what the numbers are telling you. What are the charts telling you? We have the same charts in our business and they provide us with indicators that allow us to understand the momentum of what's going on in that business. Second thing, we created a cash flow structure because so many businesses, particularly big businesses, become cash eating monsters. So we were able to remove what we call the cash flow bottlenecks and ensure that the money that we make, we were able to hold on to as much of it as possible. And the third thing is we audited the entire cash collection process to look at where there were delays in the process where money was basically sitting uncollected on the balance sheet and was essentially eroding the value of that cash because it wasn't sitting in his bank account. And over the course of about 12 months, we were able to take him from about $100,000 loss to almost a $300,000 per year profit. So it was almost a $400,000 turnaround within 12 months with no more leads, with no more clients, just working within the infrastructure that was already there and just implementing smart financial strategy to get that result. Oh, you've got to be so happy with that. I can just see that that would just fill you up knowing that you've had that impact. I just love that. And it's a very similar thing for traders. So if you don't own your own business and you're listening to this, you're not off the hook because you actually do own your own business. A trading business is the quintessential small business. And I do know that about a third of our talking trading listeners own their own business anyway outside of trading. So everything you're saying here, Jackson, can be implemented and spun around so that people can go, oh, hang on, I've got this and I can implement it right now. So Jackson, I'd love your thoughts about how people can get in touch with you and what you can do to continue working with my people. Yes. So the first part is I've, I've now published four books, all giving business owners the tools that they need to maximize the profit in their business, to buy back their time, to build a, a, a saleable asset that can actually be on sold for a substantial profit. And it's one of the cheat codes in Australia that we have the opportunity as small business owners to sell our business for anywhere up to $6 million. And in the vast majority of cases, pay zero tax. Now, like all of us complain about tax. We pay so much tax, particularly if we're trading and we're building wealth. And it's one of the simplest cheat codes. And so many business owners leave chips on the table by not leveraging that kind of strategy. And then the big part of this is that we build a business because it is a wealth creation vehicle. It provides us with profit. And we need to take that business profit and turn it into personal wealth through property and shares, um, whether that through be through passive accumulation or an active strategy uh, like you teach, Louise. And ultimately, when we've got more profit, we've got more surplus that we can then go and invest and build more wealth with. So that's the foundation of what we do. So you can check out my books. Um, you can also complete our 40-point financial performance scorecard, which will basically identify the top 40 things that get in the way for business owners creating financial freedom faster. And the scary fact is that the average score is about 18 out of 40. And basically, most people are below the, the benchmark of where they should be financially. 
But if you complete the scorecard, you'll get a customized report that'll tell you exactly what you should be doing to improve. So you get all of my books and the scorecard along with a whole heap of other tools uh, by going to wealthhealthcheck.com.au. That's wealthhealthcheck.com.au. It'll take you five minutes to fill it in, get the report, get all of the goodies and start taking action. And of course, if you'd like to get some help in a higher capacity, uh, all of our details will be on there as well. So you can reach out and we can have a chat. And Jackson, I did that. I went to wealthhealthcheck.com.au and I did do that quiz and I loved it because it got me to reinvigorate and to see that, yes, I have got lot, a lot of boxes ticked, but there were some that I did not have as completed and that I could not say I'm getting 10 out of 10, aren't I a good girl? So I do think even if you are incredibly successful as a trader, you still need to go to wealthhealthcheck.com.au. Jackson, thanks so much for your time. You have just been a gem. I just also want to give a call out to your podcast because everybody listening is going to be listening to my podcast. So how can people listen to your podcast? Yes, I've been running a podcast show called The Financial Freedom Secret Show for a bit over six years now. And it's an interview show where we get amazing guests who talk about their financial freedom secrets. What are ways to improve profit, buy back your time, build more wealth, uh, just to add practical tools to your kit bag to help you uh, create financial freedom faster. And it's available on the major streaming platforms. So feel free to go check that out. Uh, search my name, Jackson Milan, or search for Financial Freedom Secrets. Brilliant. Oh, Jackson, just fabulous. I know I'll be tuning in and I'm definitely subscribing. I've got you lined up on my podcast platform. So for everybody listening, this might be one to re-listen to because there is so much gold in it. And until next week, happy trading. 